Hearing loss, ringing in the ear, and unsteadiness can all be caused by acoustic neuroma. Welcome to the GW HealthCast. I'm Dr. Mike Smith, and today's topic, Acoustic Neuroma, Advances in Treatment and Detection. My guest is Dr. Ashkin Mumfred. Dr. Mumfred is Associate Professor of Surgery and Neurosurgery at the George Washington School of Medicine and Health Sciences and is affiliated with the George Washington University Hospital. Dr. Mumfred, welcome to the show. Glad to be here. So, acoustic neuroma. I have a feeling there's a few audience members who probably have never heard of that. So, how about give us a nice overview of what is an acoustic neuroma? Certainly. So, acoustic neuromas are very rare tumors. They're benign, as in they're not cancerous. They don't um, travel to anywhere else in the body. And there are growths that um, happen to the nerves of hearing and balance. Um, They usually cause um, progressive, slow hearing loss in one ear. They may cause tinnitus, which is um, hearing any external sounds in the ear, and they can cause balance problems over time. They are extremely rare. They happen to um, about one in 100,000 people. Mm. And so some of those symptoms you mentioned, though, could be lots of different things, right? So... Um, could you run through some of those symptoms again? And, and when should a, when should somebody go seek help or go see their doctor if they're having some of those symptoms? Certainly. Uh, majority of the time when you have these symptoms, they're caused by other conditions. For example, if you have hearing loss in, one, in only one ear, great majority of the time that is something as simple as um, earwax, for example, or fluid in the middle ear. Um, Same goes for having ringing in the ear. A very, very small fraction of patients who have ringing in one ear may have an acoustic neuroma. Now, if a person has constellation of progressive hearing loss only in one ear, ringing sounds in one ear, balance issues, um, or vertigo attacks, which is a sensation of movement that the patient may have, facial numbness, as in they, they touch their face and they can't feel it as well as the other side, or facial paralysis, so they are no longer able to move the face. These are all worrisome symptoms if they come come in as a group together. Uh, best thing always is to seek help. Um, if you suddenly lose hearing, is always an emergency because it can be from a nerve loss rather than a conduction problem such as having wax or fluid in the ear. But if there's progression of symptoms, you can always um, seek help from a regular doctor and they will lead you to see an ear, nose, and throat doctor, a hearing specialist, and and we'll take on the um, diagnosis and management from there. With some of these symptoms, you know, for instance, the the hearing loss, is is it normally something that's that develops slowly over time, or or can it be acute? So, in rare circumstances, the hearing loss from acoustic neuromas can be sudden, but that's a minority of the cases. However, in every patient who have lost Hearing suddenly from what we call a nerve loss, as in it's not from the conduction mechanism of the ear, we do obtain an MRI to look for one of these acoustic neuromas. But in great majority of the time, it's a progression of hearing loss only in one ear. Unlike, yeah. um, for example, age-related or noise-related hearing loss, which more often than not happens to both ears, um, these acoustic neuromas cause hearing loss in one ear. Okay, so so hearing loss over time in one ear, maybe some facial numbness, the ringing in the ear, and maybe some unsteadiness, some um, vertigo type symptoms, and that constellation probably is a good good sign that we need to go see our doctor. Correct? Absolutely. Now, unfortunately, yeah. these tumors can present with very subtle symptoms, but thankfully, they are extremely rare. So I don't want to alarm patients that every time they feel ringing in one ear, that's the that's that means they may have an acoustic neuroma. It's not true. Right, right. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so so when somebody finally decides um, to go see a specialist like yourself, um, how is this worked up? What's what's involved? How do we diagnose this? Um, and then eventually, what what is the um, the treatment for that? But let's let's start with just kind of like with a workup for it. Certainly. So the good news is we have MRI scans, and MRI scans with and without contrast can 
detect these tumors as small as about one millimeter, which is about a sixteenth of an inch. So our detection of these tumors have have dramatically increased over the past 30 years when we had to use um, imaging like CT scans with contrast, which could see them down to about a centimeter, but now we can see them a tenth of that size. Um, so if patient presents with worrisome symptoms, for example, one-sided hearing loss that's nerve-related or facial numbness, facial paralysis, uh, we obtain an MRI, which is a magnetic wave uh, imaging system. There's no radiation involved, and um, we administer contrast usually, and we can see the tumors, and we go from there. Yeah, and all of that can be done. Is that usually, um, you know, I like I like for my listeners to get an idea of what the experience is like. So by the time they come see a specialist like you, is, is does it take time to get that MRI? What's usually the time frame? So the the good news of acoustic neuromas is that one, they are benign, as in they're not cancerous, and two, they are very slow growing. They grow by about one to two millimeter per year. So they're, they're, they're rarely of an urgent matter. The only time they become an emergency is when they've grown to such a large size that they're compressing the brain and causing issue with the outflow of the fluid from around the brain. Now, when they're smaller, um, usually by the time they see um, an uh, audiologist, these are doctors that specialize in hearing, they obtain a hearing test, they see the specialist. We usually order an MRI, which can be done within you know one to two weeks. Um, the MRI is not always pleasant because, as you, as your listeners may know, it's a fairly narrow tube uh, for patients who are claustrophobic. We may have to provide them with some medication, either by mouth or through the vein, to calm them down while they're going through the MRI scan. It is a fairly lengthy MRI scan; can take about 30 to 40 minutes. So, for someone who is severely uh, claustrophobic and they can't be in confined spaces, can be can can be difficult. Yes, yes. But 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 you can help them out with some medication, make the experience of a little course. bit better to, to get through that. Yeah. So that's good. We have good. different so, so, levels of help we can provide. Right, right, right. <laughs> All right. So let's say um, you do find an acoustic neuroma, you're making that diagnosis. Um, what's the treatment plan at that point? I would assume it's kind of based on the severity of symptoms, how big it is. Kind of run us through how you approach this when it comes time for treatment. Absolutely. So acoustic neuroma is... is uh, treatment fairly specialized, and it has to be custom tailored to that particular patient. Um, Because thankfully they are benign tumor and very slow growing, there's no urgency in most cases to provide treatment. For a large group of these patients, upon diagnosis, we recommend watchful waiting. That means the patient will see us back again, sometimes between 6 and 12 months later with a new MRI. Uh, We um, compare the two MRIs to see if the tumor has shown any signs of growth. About a third of the patient's um, tumors do not grow from the time of diagnosis, and these are the patients we will just monitor for years to come and spread their MRIs farther and farther apart. The other two-thirds that either are symptomatic or the tumors are growing over time, we offer them treatment. The treatment comes in two forms. We can offer microsurgery. These are delicate operations that uh, my neurosurgeon and myself, we would make an incision, go into the skull, and remove the tumor, or uh, stereotactic radiation. And these are radiation that provide as very small um, dose rays of radiation from different um, angles around the body, usually done either with a cyber knife, which is a robotic arm, or with a gamma knife, which is a dome that the patient goes inside. And these ray- rays of radiation all have a very small amount of energy, and as they're going through the skull and the brain to get to the tumor, they cause very minimal effect on the normal healthy tissue. But because they're all triangulated into the tumor, the tumor sees the summation of all these rays and Mm -hmm. receives a massive dose of radiation. It is not the same type of radiation we use to provide treatment for many cancers. It's a much lower dose radiation to the surrounding tissue. So one-third of the patients pretty much is just uh, for maybe the rest of their life. You're just watching and and following up with a few MRIs. And then it was the two-thirds that either there's worsening symptoms and or growth of the tumor. So that's kind of how we're we're putting putting these patients in into two broad groups. When it comes to the two thirds where treatment has to be done, um what's the outcome? You know, if it's if it's the if it's the surgical way versus 
the radiation way? What, what can they expect um, down the line following that treatment? Certainly. It is an extremely complex algorithm because radiation and surgery have very different effects and very different outcomes in certain, certain words. For example, the downtime of a patient with radiation is close to zero. The risk of the patient developing any weakness in their face or facial paralysis is fairly close to zero. But there is a very small, albeit real, real risk of developing cancers from the radiation. Um, the risk is extremely small, but it is a real risk. Whereas with surgery, patient usually requires about a month of downtime. You know, they are only in the hospital for about an average three to five days, but they can't uh, um, exert themselves too much or take on heavy activity for sometimes around four to six weeks after surgery. Mm, There's also okay. risk of facial paralysis and, and other risks associated with surgery for the surgical group. So what we have to do is um, go through the algorithm with the patient and see based on their age, based on the size of the tumor, based on other symptoms that they're having, which one of these two modalities are the better treatment and then take them through it. Dr. Monfred, why don't you, like, just to kind of summarize all this, just tell us um, what would you like people to know about acoustic neuroma? Sure. I would like them to know that they are not cancers, they are not brain tumors, they are tumors that grow outside of the brain in the inner ear. I would like them to not forego if they're having a constellation symptoms of one-sided hearing loss, one-sided tinnitus, um, if their balance is getting affected uh, more and more, and particularly if they're having progressive headaches, facial numbness, and facial paralysis, to seek care from their primary care at least, and then they would refer them out to um, experts such as myself, and we can take them through the treatment. I would like them to know that there there is a variety of treatment options available to them, and a diagnosis of acoustic neuroma is not a death sentence. It's, it's something that um, they have a variety of options that um, they can pursue. Dr. Mumfred, I want to thank you for the work that you're doing, and also thank you for coming on the show today. You're listening to the GW HealthCast. Please visit gwdocs.com to get connected with Dr. Munfred or another provider. Or you can call 1-888-4GW-DOCS to schedule an in-person or virtual appointment. I'm Dr. Mike Smith. Thanks for listening.